Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityur ma amritam gamaya, om shanti shanti shanti. Good evening to everybody, and it's great to be back. My pranams to Riviyad Maharaj, who invited me to give this talk. Um, it's a regular Upanishad class, so I'll be speaking about the Upanishads, but this will be more in the line of a general talk. Yes, as uh, Maharaj said, the Vedanta Society of New York is the first of the Vedanta Societies, and it was established in 1894. Swami Vivekananda came to this country in 1893, and the very next year, the Vedanta Society of New York was established. There's a very nice book about, the, uh, about how East, Eastern wisdom came to Western shores. Phil Goldberg's um, American Veda. So I'd like to start with, a, with an anecdote from that book, which is both amusing and instructive. Um, he, uh, he says that once he was uh, on a tour to India in Rishikesh, on the foothills of the Himalayas. And he saw this little hut where a monk, <clears throat> a common sight in, in uh, Rishikesh, where you have these little huts where monks stay on the bank of the Ganges. And so there was this monk who was staying there, a sadhu. And the author of the book, he struck up a conversation with him, was happy to find that, that young man, the, he was a young monk who spoke fluent English. So he asked him, how did he become a monk? What's his life story? And this man, he said, uh, as a young man, he was an atheist. Uh, he got a chance to go to the United States to study. And then he came to the United States and studied in an Ivy League college. He studied literature. He studied Emerson and was introduced to Eastern wisdom through Emerson and decided to become a monk back in India. <laughs> now, that's very instructive. You know, this kind of cultural ping pong, back and forth which has been going on. Emerson has been called by one of his biographers the mind of America. And then the biographer goes on to note that very few people know how much that mind has been shaped by Indian thought. Emerson had the best collection of Indian philosophy books at that time in, the, in, in America. He was acquainted very thoroughly with the Bhagavad Gita. There are references to the Gita in his writings, in his talks, um, with the Upanishads. He lent some of those books to Thoreau. Thoreau, when he went to Walden, every day he would read the Bhagavad Gita. Every day in the morning he would read a few pages of the Bhagavad Gita. So this is really remarkable, how there's cultural exchange from India to Emerson and back to the Sadhu who became a, an Indian, young Indian man who becomes a monk, goes back to his Upanishadic Ved, Vedantic roots because of Emerson. Thoreau, then Walt Whitman, he was strongly influenced by Indian thought and more and more research which is coming up, uh, it shows the enormous impact of Upanishadic thought. I read uh, in, in T.S. Eliot's papers he was very well acquainted with Upanishads and with, with uh, Gita. He knew Sanskrit. In fact, in the original manuscripts of his poems, on the margins, there are the original quotations from the Gita and the Upanishads, which later he put in beautiful language in his poetry. And in one place he writes, you can Google this, he writes, when I read these ancient sages, I see that compared to them, our philosophers of today are mere schoolboys. He says that, T.S. Eliot. These Upanishads, they came to the West a long time ago, uh, more than 200 years ago. Uh, the story has been told in a book, Journey of the Upanishads to the West, by Swami Tathagatananda, who was the Swami in charge of the New York Vedanta Society until last year. So he tells the story. And how um, Schopenhauer, the great German philosopher, he came across a Latin translation of a Persian translation of the Sanskrit original. 
and reading that, the book was called Upnikhat. There's space here. You can come over here. Come. <coughs> reading that, he said, I consider the study of these Upanishads the most beneficial of all study in the world. The most beneficial study in the world is the study of these Upanishads. He says, except perhaps the originals. He says. And every day, he would go to bed. Before going to bed, he would read a few pages of the Upanishad. That very dry and difficult Latin translation of a Persian translation of the Sanskrit original. He said, the, study, the Upanishads have been the solace of my life. And they will be the solace of my death. That was Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer's impact should not be underestimated. He was the most uh, seminal influence on Nietzsche. And from Nietzsche comes a great deal of modern, uh, postmodern thought also, critical thought. A lot of it is traced back uh, to Nietzsche. So from Nietzsche to Schopenhauer, back to the Upanishads. In Schopenhauer's masterpiece, The World as Will and Idea, it runs to four volumes in German, which I do not know, but I skimmed through the English translation. And in the very first chapter, Schopenhauer writes that what is to follow in these pages was best known to the ancient Indians. They called it Maya. There are a number of references to Vedanta in the first few pages of uh, Schopenhauer's masterpiece, The World as Will and Idea. These Upanishads, they form the highest philosophical teaching of the Vedas. The Vedas, we know, are the fundamental spiritual religious texts of the Indians, of, of the Hindus. And in the Vedas, the Upanishads form the philosophical spiritual part of it. They form actually a very small part of the Vedas. There are collect Upanishads are a collection of texts in, Sans in ancient Vedic Sanskrit. And um, these Upanishads are collectively called Vedanta. If you ask, we are sitting here in the Vedanta society, what is Vedanta? Literally the word Vedanta would mean the end of the Vedas, literally. But end is not what is meant here. Anta here means, in Sanskrit, and the, the meaning which is taken here is Nirnayarte, in the conclusion. The final conclusion, the highest teaching of the Vedas, is the Upanishads. So that's why it's called Vedanta, the final teaching of the Vedas. Literally, definition of Vedanta. When we learned Vedanta at, in our monastery, our primers, the, the first books which we, from which we learned Vedanta is called Vedanta Sara, the essence of, of Vedanta. And there at the beginning you get a definition of Vedanta. Vedanta Nama Upanishad Pramanam. What is Vedanta? Simple, direct definition. Vedanta means the source of spiritual knowledge called Upanishads. So the collection of texts called Upanishads is Vedanta, literally. And what we know as the Bhagavad Gita is simply a collection of teachings from the, Veda, from the Upanishads. Sri Krishna in the Gita is often directly quoting the Upanishads. Sometimes um, you can see the, almost the same verse, the exact same mantra from the Upanishad which comes in the Gita. So he is a kind of original plagiarist, you know, Krishna. <laughs> uh, so he just takes the Upanishads and quotes from it. So the Bhagavad Gita is also the Upanishads. The Brahma Sutra, the philosophical aphorisms are also based on the Upanishads. So the central texts of Vedanta are the Upanishads. In fact, the central texts of Hinduism are the Upanishads. The great philosophical systems of Hinduism they are all interpretations of the Upanishads. Advaita Vedanta, non-dual school of Vedanta. Vishishta Advaita Vedanta, the qualified monistic school of Vedanta. Dvaita Vedanta, the dualistic school of Vedanta. Dvaita Advaita Vedanta. Uh, Shuddha Advaita Vedanta. Uh, Achintya Veda Veda. Multiple schools of Vedanta. They are different and all these schools are just interpretations of the Upanishads. They may seem very esoteric, philosophical, uh, meant for an elite few, but actually their influence on modern Hinduism is incalculable. If you approach modern Hinduism, suppose you go, you see the Hare Krishna singing and dancing. 
they don't seem to be directly connected to the Upanishads, yet the distance between them and the Upanishads is very little because the philosophical foundations of the uh, Krishna consciousness movement is what is called Achintya Bheda Ved, the philosophy of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And that's the school of Vedanta. If you go to the, the, in the Chino Hills, this magnificent Swaminarayan temple, so you will see the, uh, the images of gods and goddesses of the, of the masters of their lineage. But behind it all is a philosophical system called uh, Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta of Ramanujacharya. Their roots of that particular movement of Hinduism lies in the qualified monastic school of Vedanta. You are here today. We have all gathered in the Vedanta society. And our roots lies in the non-dualist school of Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, our philosophical roots. The Holy Mother, Ma Sharada, she said, your master, Sri Ramakrishna, was Brahman himself, Advaita. He was the non-dual reality himself. And you, I can say with definite with, with emphasis, I can say that you are all Advaita Vadi, you are non dualist Vedantins. Yes, do come. These Upanishads are many in number. In the Muktika Upanishad, you get a list of 108 Upanishads. But out of them, 10 have become prominent. When you actually study the Upanishads, there are what we call 10 major Upanishads the Isha Upanishad the Kena Upanishad, the Kata Upanishad, the Prashna Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, Aitareya Upanishad, Taittiriya Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, and Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. These are the, what we call the ten major Upanishads. And they are major because Shankaracharya, 1400 years ago, the great philosopher saint, he selected these ten Upanishads to write his his magnificent commentaries in Sanskrit. They are wonderful philosophical texts, matchless. And they are all commentaries on these ten Upanishads. To this list, if you add one more, which is a matter of scholarly debate whether it's an original commentary of Shankaracharya or not, the Shvetashvatar Upanishad with its commentary by Shankaracharya, then the list is extended to 11 Upanishads. But anyway, this is the, the fundamental basis of Vedanta these ten Upanishads. To that you add the Bhagavad Gita, the Brahma Sutra and many, many, many other texts. But fundamentally these Upanishads. As we go into these Upanishads, we find that they are remarkable texts. They are remarkable for two reasons. One is for the questions and the second is for the answers. These Upanishads are often in the form of dialogues between teacher and student. Sometimes the names of the teachers and students are mentioned, sometimes they are not mentioned, but clearly there are questions and there are answers. You go to a spiritual master and ask your question, <clears throat> and the answer becomes the Upanishad. The questions are among the profoundest questions we can think about. These are what we call the big questions, the meaning of life. Is there an ultimate reality? What happens after death? What is the purpose of human life? What is this universe? What's going on here? In, in the Mundaka Upanishad, the student goes to the teacher and asks, Sir, what is that one thing by knowing which I, know, I can know everything in this universe? What a profound question. If you, the original Sanskrit is beautiful. Shaunako Havai Mahashalo Angira Samvidivadupasanna Papracha. Shaunaka, very prosperous, powerful man, accomplished person, goes to his teacher Angiras in a proper way and asks a question. Kasminu Bhagavo Vigyate Sarvamidam Vigyatam Bhavati Iti. Sir, what is that? which being known, everything becomes known. That's the question. Can you see? It's the, the impersonal nature of the whole thing strikes you first. There is no breadth of what you might call conventional religion. God and believe this and do this and you'll be rewarded with this or punished with that. None of that. It's the highest philosophy. Swami Vivekananda says as a human thought reached its 
Himalayan peaks, the mountain peaks in the, in the Upanishads, where the human lung can scarce breathe, such rarefied levels it attained. One, uh, there's a book, Waking, Dreaming, Being, Evan Thompson, a Canadian philosopher from the University of British Columbia. It's a book on Upanishads, Buddhism, and modern neuroscience, the science of consciousness. And he starts off by saying, it's only in recent years, in the last two decades or so, that modern science, um, science has become seriously interested in consciousness and we have got consciousness studies. And yet, he says, consciousness studies did not start 20 years ago. Consciousness studies started with the Upanishads. And he quotes another writer um, saying, the Upanishads are so important that instead of dating our history with AD and BC, we should date our history with before Upanishads and after Upanishads. Waking, dreaming and being, even Thompson. Such tremendous questions. What is consciousness? That is a central question in the Upanishads. In the Chandogya Upanishad we find a young man who has come back from school, from college, graduating. And he is proud of his knowledge, of his learning. He has learned all the branches of knowledge that there are. And his father sees that the boy is proud of his learning. So his father punctures his ego by asking him a question. Son, welcome back. But in your school, did, the, you, did your teachers teach you that knowledge by knowing which everything else is known? Same question, you see. And the son is uh, confused. How is it possible? By knowing one branch of knowledge, you know one aspect of reality. By knowing another branch of, branch of knowledge, you know another aspect of reality. If you study chemistry, you know, you know chemicals. If you study botany, you know plants. But how can, you know, how can there be one branch of knowledge by knowing which you know everything? Is that possible? And then the analysis goes there. He says, yes, it's possible. How is it possible? How is it possible to know one thing and yet know everything? Because, he says, by knowing, by knowing clay, you know everything that is made of clay. In what sense? He says, if there's a lump of clay, and out of that you make many kinds of pottery, one thing you already know, you don't know what kinds of pottery will be made by the potter. Depends on the ingenuity and the skill of the potter. But one thing you know, whatever the potter makes with that clay, you know one thing, that all of that is clay. Yes, of course. Whatever the potter may make, make, maybe in centuries in the future, maybe genius potter may make fantastic new pots and stuff with, with clay. But you can predict without knowing any of that, you can predict it's all made of clay. Well, how did you know that? How did you know by knowing only one clay, you can you know thousands and countless products made of clay? Because clay is the material cause and all those products are the effect of clay, effect in the sense like wood is the cause and this is the effect made of wood. If you know the wood, you know all furniture which could be particularly made by wood. You don't know what shape they will take, what kind it will be, what use it will be put to. You don't know all of that, but you know the reality that there is. The reality of this is that it, this is wood. When I touch it, I say touch wood. So the reality here is wood. The reality of a pot made of clay is clay. That kind of thought, by knowing the material cause, the substance out of which it is made, you know the reality of all the products. It bears repetition. By knowing the cause, material cause, one knows the effect. Knows the effect in what sense? Knows the reality of the effect. What is it actually? Karana, in Sanskrit, if you know the karana cause, you know the karyam effect. The karana is usually one. Out of one material you can produce many kinds of effects. If you know the one material out of which many effects are produced, you know what they are all in reality. So what? The Upanishads make this enormous claim that there is one reality out of which this enormous universe that you experience, you yourself, and whatever you experience in life, all other people, plants and animals, good things and bad things, happiness and misery, stars and galaxies and protons and neutrons, 
all of that is the product, is the effect of one primal cause. One primal cause. That primal cause is called Brahman. Therefore, if you know that Brahman, then you know everything. That kind of thought is there. It's not, it's not just a claim. The remarkable thing about the Upanishads is they will show you. They will take you by the hand and actually acquaint you with this Brahman. Till at least, if you just study the Upanishad systematically, if you have a good teacher and you study it, at the end of the study, you may not be enlightened. You may not be a, a saint, you may not be a Ramakrishna or a Ramana Maharshi or whatever. But intellectually at least, in understanding at least, you cannot deny this is extraordinarily profound. That yes, it is possible. That yes, I am convinced that there is a spiritual reality of which all of this is a product. Today I shall consider two questions from the Upanishads. One is the general question of religion. How Upanishad sees religion. And the second one, the second question is the question of consciousness. And I'll relate it to what we, what we see today. Let's take up the first question. We'll see what it means. The question of religion in general. What is the Upanishadic view? If you ask the Upanishads, they're so systematic that on, on the surface they do not seem systematic. On the surface they seem like a wild profusion of different teachings. But if you uh, see, study it with, for example, Shankaracharya's commentaries, you see the systematization, the systematic thinking behind it. So they're so systematic that all of these Upanishads can actually be summarized in one sentence. If you want to take away from this talk, somebody asks you after the talk, so you went to a class on the Upanishads. What do the Upanishads teach? You can tell them in one sentence. That thou art. Tat tuam asi. It's a quote from the Chandogya Upanishad, the sixth chapter, where this is repeated nine times. That thou art. Tat tuam asi. I was walking, I take a walk in Central Park uh, in New York. It's just one block, less than one block away from the uh, Vedanta Society. It's very nicely located. Half a block away, Yoko Ono still lives there. I haven't seen her though. <laughs> That's where John Lennon lived and he was shot. And it's, a, it's a, an American theater pilgrimage. You have people from all over the world, not just America, coming there and taking, clicking pictures. And, and there is strawberry fields and there are aging hippies who still they sit there and they sing, um, imagine, and uh, let it be, and, uh, and so many songs. They sing there. And I walk through that daily. And there's a link. The Beatles, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, who is a um, descendant of a Vedantic tradition, again the Upanishads. And a lot of that, the Gita and the Upanishads found its way back into George Harrison's music and all that, you know. Anyway, again, you can see links there. But what I wanted to say was, I was walking through that, and once in a while I have an interesting uh, back and forth with the, the hippies, these uh, oldsters. <laughs> now, they are the ones who know me, who know what I am. You know, sometimes I get a namaste from them. Sometimes one of them shouts out to the crowd, crowd there, man, I love my Himalayan brothers. He just points out. <laughs> I, have to make my, I have to make my escape quickly. <laughs> now. One of them, one of them said, I was walking past him, long with beads and long hair. Um, he says, hey, you look like the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> and just a few days ago, I was walking back out of the Central Park and with this, this person who was bare bodied and with beads and long hair. And he said to me, if there's one thing that you could say to me, what would it be? And you know, this the whole of the Upanishad so easily summarized into that thou art. I said that and he got it. <laughs> that thou art. That meaning that one cause out of which this entire universe, of which the entire universe is a manifestation in the, in the Chandogya Upanishad, 
it starts, the sixth chapter starts with that young man who came back very proud of his learning and his father said, do you know that, did you, did, were you taught that one branch of, that one knowledge by knowing which everything is known, that chapter? When the father starts speaking to the son, teaching him, he says, Sadeva dvitiyam. In the beginning, before all this universe, there was one reality, one without a second, pure existence, pure being without a second. It starts with like that. And that pure being is that which you see now as this multifarious universe. Cause, karanam, effect, karyam. One, many. If you know that one, you know the many. In what sense do you know the many? You know all of them are that one reality. So again and again that the father tells the son, tat tvam asi, that thou art. That meaning what? That pure being, one existence, Brahman. Thou, you who consider yourself to be a young man, really you are mistaken. You are not this body. You are not this mind. You are not this little person you think you are. You are actually that infinite being, that original being, which is this entire universe which you see, see in front of you. That one being, pure being, immortal being, that spiritual reality, you are. And he explains it in detail and you can actually appreciate how I am that being, how I am not just a, a bundle of uh, you know, flesh and blood and bones. So that thou art is repeated nine times in the Chandogya Upanishad. This statement, that thou art, tat tvam asi, gives us the entire, come in, come in, there's a lot of space here, do come. The, the profound understanding of religion that the Upanishads have. If you take an Upanishadic point of view, you get a remarkable understanding of the religions of the world. In fact, Aldous Huxley, who worked here in the Vedanta Society of Southern California, in his uh, masterpiece, The Perennial Philosophy, he goes back to the Upanishadic worldview and from there looks at the different religions of the world and he finds the underlying, one underlying perennial philosophy. He, says, he calls it the highest common factor of all religions. Now what is it? Let's explore this a while. Remember what we are doing, where we are. I said in the Upanishads, I'll take up two major themes in this talk. One is um, the Upanishadic worldview of, the Upanishadic view of religions. That's what I'm doing now. The second one will be the more specific question of consciousness. That thou art. That meaning Brahman. Thou meaning you. Now, all the religions of the world can actually be classified as that oriented religions or thou oriented religions. That oriented religions or thou oriented religions. What does that mean? If you look at the religions of the world, they are about God. You would say, obviously, what, are, what, can, what else can they be about? But not all religions. For example, if you consider Buddhism, it's a religion, but doesn't speak about God. Either it is silent about God or outright denies the existence of any such being. Buddhism. And there are others. Jainism, um, in Hindu philosophy, if you take Sankhya, yoga, yoga does speak about God, but the God of yoga, Ishwara of yoga is, is not the creator God of, uh, of, uh, of Vedanta or of any other religion. So there are religions which are centered on God, that centered religions. Christianity, all of Christianity, Judaism, all of Judaism. Islam. Do come in. Don't peek. Come in, come in, come in. It's very distracting if you keep peeking. Come, come, come. There's a lot of space here. Come, come. Christianity. Judaism. Islam. Many branches of Hinduism, Vaishnavism, the worshippers of Vishnu, or Rama, or Krishna, Shaivism, the worshippers of Shiva, 
um, Shaktaism, the worshippers of the Divine Mother. God, in Hinduism, has multifarious forms and names. So Shiva or Vishnu can be man, can be woman, can be with form, can be without form. So all of these are God-centered religions. You see, what else can they be? You know, it's very interesting. An interfaith conference, I saw in one interfaith conference, was organized by the Sikhs on the uh, occasion of the 300th anniversary of um, Guru Gobind Singh making the Guru Granth Sahib, the, the Guru of the Sikhs. So it was held in Nanded in southern India. Um, so it was an interfaith conference and they were uh, representatives of all religions, including Buddhism also. They were Lamas who had been sent by the Dalai Lama. Now, one by one, the Sikhs and the Hindus and uh, uh, the Christians, there was a rabbi from New York and uh, the Jews, they came up and talked about God and the grace of God and the love of God and how we are all children of God. Nice. And I saw the Lama sitting at the back and smiling. They're too polite to say so, but from their point of view, it's just superstition. All God talk. What does it mean to them? Nothing. From the God-centered religions, when you look at the, um, the thou-centered, where self-inquiry is the goal, Buddhism and Jainism and, uh, and yoga and the Sankhya, from, from the God-centered religions, the that-centered religions, when you look at the, at the thou-centered religions, the attitude is, those are not religions. They are atheistic people. How can it be a religion without God? It's difficult to understand for a person who's brought up in a God-centered tradition to look at something like Buddhism, which you sit quietly and follow the breath or something. What's he doing? And often it has been condemned as being um, self-centered or navel-gazing, uh, something like that, which is not truly a religion. You cannot understand that approach. So on one side, they look at the God-centered religions and they'll say, that's superstition. What grounds have you got to believe in some supreme uh, being, some supreme dictator in the skies? Nothing. And from the other side, they look at these religions and say that, the, that this, is, this is some kind of superstition. This is some kind of, sorry, this is some kind of um, selfishness, self-obsession. And there are great differences between these approaches. If you look at the God-centered religions, Usually they are devotional in nature. Christian traditions or Vaishnava traditions, they will talk about love of God, Islam, surrender to God. Belief, faith, love, surrender, and often ritual. And uh, temples and churches and uh, mosques. And so God-centered religions, they have something in common, something like this. On the other hand, if you look at the thou-centered religions, which they are based on self-inquiry, you will find they are more um, meditative, more philosophical, more introverted, often more monastic in, in, in nature. Buddhism, Jainism, heavily monastic in nature. Um, Sankhya, Yoga. Again, the great differences. And they have advantages and disadvantages. The two kinds of approaches to religion are, are, we, are you with me on this? The two approaches, are they becoming clear? The two approaches to religion? And they seem so different. They have advantages and disadvantages. You know, uh, what is the, um, the great disadvantage of a God-centered religion? The most obvious disadvantage, which is becoming more and more clear in today's world. What is the uh, great, great disadvantage? The great disadvantage of a God-centered religion is it's based on faith. It demands that you believe, to begin, to begin in a devotional religion demands that you believe. And if your belief is challenged, then it gets shaken. On what basis do you believe? You believe on the basis of authority. You believe on the basis of scripture. You believe on the basis of tradition. You might say, that's why Ramakrishna's approach was so powerful because he says, I believe on the basis because I have seen on experience. That's what really, you know, when, Sri when Swami Vivekananda came to the West, 
one of his central messages was God is not a matter of faith alone. God is not a matter of, of belief alone. Alone, God is not a matter of tradition or books. God can be experienced and must be experienced. The purpose of life is to realize God, to actually experience God. Religion is realization. So that was such a powerful message. But generally the God-centered religions are based on faith. And today, if you see the attacks of the new atheists, Daniel Dennett or Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens or Sam Harris, they all attack the God-centered religions. The atheistic attacks are usually on the God-centered religions. And uh, um, the God-centered religions find it very difficult to defend, especially in the age of science. Modern science seems to cut away at the very roots of belief in God. Whatever earlier was attributed to God, now modern science can offer better explanations. Everything in this universe, whether it is the origin of the universe, whether it is life, whatever. Science is offering every day coming up with better explanations than religion ever did. And so religion is on the back foot, you know, it's defensive. They derisively call God now the God of the gaps. God of the gaps is whatever science cannot explain as yet. You people in religion, you quickly take that position and say, look, this is what God has done. You cannot explain it in science, so this is what God has done. Now the gaps are ever diminishing. Science is explaining more and more. And therefore the space for the God of the gaps is diminishing. God is being squeezed into non-existence. That's the problem, the great problem. And you find people in God-centered religions, even people who seriously follow that, they are again and again plagued. They are plagued by doubt. The stories of saints who followed these religions and believed and prayed and meditated and they would be plagued by waves of doubt. They would call it you know, like a dark night of the soul or dark night of faith. The dark, dark night of the soul has a deeper meaning in Christian mysticism. But even then, a general meaning is that I am praying and praying. Is it really there? Does God really exist? Who knows? That's a great disadvantage of the God-centered religion. But the thou-centered religion, the self-inquiry-based religions, they do not have this disadvantage. Why? Because their subject matter is not a God in heaven. Their subject matter is you. And your own existence is undeniable. If there is anything that you are certain about, it's me. I. I exist, no doubt about it. What am I is the subject of, this, of these religions, inquiry. So whether it's Buddhism, the answers they come to are different. Whether it's Buddhism or Sankhya, or Yoga or Jainism, they take up the individual and investigate the individual. That's the advantage of the thou-centered religions. What is the disadvantage? You will notice I'm not putting Vedanta in, you would expect that I'm going to put Vedanta in the thou-centered religion, but I'm not. What's the disadvantage of a thou-centered religion? The disadvantage is this, whereas the that-centered, God-centered religions have an advantage here. What is the advantage of a God-centered religion, a disadvantage of a thou-centered religion, of the uh, self-inquiry-based religion? It's this, though my own experience is beyond doubt, I do not doubt that I, ex I exist. But my existence does not solve any problem. In fact, my existence is the problem. I'm surrounded by a thousand problems. <laughs> I have mortgages, I have, uh, I have health issues, I have relationship issues, I have financial issues. I know I'm going to die one day. Death issues. I have parking issues. <laughs> Just the fact that I exist doesn't solve any problem for me. That's the source of all my problems. And in contrast, God has no problems at all. God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnip omnipresent. God is all-powerful, can do everything and anything. God is beyond all trouble. God, if he, she, it exists. If it exists. Then God has no problem. I certainly exist, but I have a lot of problems. You see, on the God-centered religions, you will see in all of these religions, Christianity, for example, you find an effort to prove the existence of God. Strong efforts, enormous efforts put forward by theologians, arguments for the existence of God. 
Thomas Aquinas in Summa Theologica, the five proofs of the existence of God. Even now books are being written, ontological proof of the existence of God. In another land, another age, in the Nyaya philosophy, who are dualistic philosophers in India, the great philosophers, they put forth, the Indian logicians, they put forth proofs of the existence of Ishwara, of God. Same problem. How do you justify? There was a thousand year battle between the Buddhists and the Indian logicians, dualists, the Hindu dualists. The dualists trying to prove the existence of God and the Buddhists attacking the very existence of God. The great logician Udayanacharya, Nayaika, who lived over a thousand, thousand years ago in 1000 AD, he puts forth nine proofs of the existence of God. But, and don't worry, don't worry about the proof, these proofs of existence of God because if you're interested, oh, I would like to know how to prove the existence of God. If you actually study the proofs, you will be underwhelmed. <laughs> I think Anthony Kenny, who is a well-known philosopher, he said he decided to become a philosopher, he had decided to become a priest. So when he was studying theology, he studied the proofs of the existence of God and decided that he is not convinced. He decided not to become a priest and became a philosopher instead <laughs> by studying the proofs of the existence of God. So they are so unconvincing that... But anyway, what I mean is, in such diverse traditions as Christianity in medieval Europe and uh, Hin dualistic Hinduism in ancient India, you find the same effort trying to prove the existence of God, thereby showing the great what troubled them, you know? That really, whole thing is based on God. Suppose God doesn't exist. You might say Ramakrishna said he saw God. Well, good for Ramakrishna, but that doesn't solve the problem of everybody else. There also you have to believe Ramakrishna. Now, so these proofs of the existence of God, Whereas on the thou-centered religions, the, the, the self-enquiry based religions, there is no need to prove your own existence. Nobody ever doubts it. Now, what Vedanta does here, this is the incre incredible thing about Vedanta, the Upanishads. What the Upanishads say is, the thou-centered religions, what they finally find God, Brahman, uh, they, I mean sorry, thou-centered religions, self-enquiry, what you finally find yourself, as an infinite consciousness, Atman, the reality within whatever you found, in whatever sense. And the that-centered religion, God-centered religions, what they finally end up with in Upanishadic terms, Brahman, they are one and the same. That's the remarkable conclusion of the Upanishads. You take a path of self-inquiry, where you will end up and you take a path of devotion and faith to God, where you will finally end up when you reach the peak of the mountain, that particular mountain, you will find you have reached the same peak. That thou art. This is the remarkable conclusion of the Upanishads. From that conclusion you trace all the possible religions of the world. Everything is explained there. There was this rabbi who visited from Jerusalem. He was visiting Belur much, so I was given the duty of showing him around. And we were speaking about Judaism and the Upanishadic understanding. So when I was talking about Judaism, uh, about its dualistic approach to God, the Father, the Creator, and, and then I, I quickly apologized because I said, look, that's our view of Judaism. And that, sounds, that might sound patronizing or condescending. I, I know, that's, but from the, our, our perspective, we look at it this way. He said something remarkable. He said, you know, Swami, you, the meaning the Hindus, you might actually have a superior understanding of our religion than we might have. It's quite possible. Why not? If you have a, 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 a deeper, wider philosophical framework, then you get a better understanding of all the religions of the world, which the practitioners of that religion might not have that much of uh, understanding. So, the Upanishadic approach is this. Now, you know what is the advantage of this? It combines the advantages of the that-centered religion and the thou-centered religion, God-centered religion and the self-inquiry based religions. It combines their advantages and eliminates the disadvantages. This is how, listen carefully, this is a remarkable insight the Upanishads have. The very certainty of your own existence 
is combined with the infinitude of God's existence. You see, what do you discover when you follow the Upanishads? You follow that thou art. I am Brahman. I, my own existence is certain. There's no doubt that I exist. But my problem is, I as this body, as this person, I'm subject to old age, death, destruction, so many problems. My existence is beset with problems. God's existence, doubtful, but has no problems. Can you combine my certainty of my existence with the infinitude of God's existence? I'll repeat that. Can you combine the certainty of your own existence with the infinitude of God's existence? What the Upanishads do is, they will investigate and they will take you by the hand and show that you, who certainly exist, you are not this limited body and mind. You are an infinite existence consciousness bliss. The infinitude of God is your infinitude. And the certainty of your own existence then becomes the certainty of God's existence. What is the proof of God's existence? Your existence. A Swami in, in the Himalayas asked another Swami, give me a, an irrefutable proof of the existence of God. And the immediate answer, of course, from a non-dualistic Swami was, the immediate answer was, your own existence, Swami. Irrefutable proof of the existence of God. Your own existence. You don't doubt it. But what the problem with our own existence is, we think it's limited to this body and mind. Vedanta shows you that you are not limited to this body and mind. Are you with me? Yes? Do you see the, the amazing insight? If you could be certain of something like an infinite existence like God, as certain that you exist, how remarkable that would be. How tremendous. That's one insight I'll share with you and, and leave it at that. How Upanishad looks at religion. I love that Sufi poet who says, when I searched for God, I found myself. When I searched for myself, I found God. It's exactly that thing, that thou art. The only thing is, the Sufis have the most ecstatic poetry. But they don't have the philosophical uh, these, the structure which can take you step by step to that thing. Which can actually take you by the hand and take you to that and directly give you, give you the Understanding the intuitive realization, straight away. Sometimes all the religions of the world, um, the, the, this uh, cr Christian theologian of the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, I forget, I'm missing his name right now. Um, he, he wrote a book. He wrote a book. Um, it, it says, God as being consciousness bliss. God as being consciousness bliss. And the chapters of the book are, remember, this is the Christian theologian of Eastern Orthodox Church. The names of the chapters of the book are Sat Chit Ananda. And he says, the final, the highest understanding of God in all the religions of the world is this. It is most clearly found in the Upanishads of Hinduism. But it's, that understanding is there in all the religions of the world. Sorry, I'm missing the name of the person. But God as existence consciousness, please. No, no. Very recent. He, he, is, uh, he is working even now. He's written a number of books. So I'll leave it at that. Now let's go to the second question. I still have 10 minutes. So <laughs> The second great question is, question of consciousness, the consciousness studies today. In the Kano Upanishad, you find this question. Keneshitam patati preshitam mana kena prana pratama praiti yukta keneshitam vachami mam vadanti chakshu shrotram kaudeva yunakti. What does it mean? The Kena Upanishad starts with the word Sanskrit word Kena. That's why it's called Kena Upanishad. Kena literally means by what? And look at the look at the question. The student asks this question. By what? He asked the teacher. The teacher is nameless, the student is nameless. They're just the questions are there and the answers. 
by what does my mind think these thoughts? By what are these words spoken? What shining being enables these ears to hear the, the uh, breath to flow in this body? So all these, our conscious experiences, what he's asking is, you are seeing, you are hearing, you are smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, speaking, remembering, all these things, understanding, all of these are what we call conscious experiences. Is that not so? And he's asking a question, maybe the most fundamental question of all, to which modern science has come just now. Just now. How is it possible? You'll say, why is, why is it difficult to understand? How is it possible? A material system, a physical body, a biological system, made of flesh and blood and bones and organs and tissue, completely material. How can it have an inner first person experience? The difference I say is this. I don't know if the Google car is still learning on the streets in, uh, in California. Um, you drive and the Google car comes up, which is an autonomous car driven by computers. In Pittsburgh it's working. So you sit there and the driver is actually not driving. Now, even now they have a driver just to, for your comfort. Computer is driving it. The driver sits there with his hands above the wheel like that. In case something goes terribly wrong, he'll catch the wheel. But the computer is driving. Now you are driving your car and this other computer driven car pulls up beside you. And then the light changes from red to green and you, you accelerate, both of you. Both of you, from a distance, you are behaving in the same way. If people look at the human-driven car and the computer-driven car, both are behaving in the same way. Is that not so? Maybe the computer-driven car, they claim it's better driven, than they drive, it drives better than human beings. That's what they're saying. They're going to make lanes narrower. Lanes are wide because, this is, because we have, uh, human beings have a lot of error. We can't drive straight according to the computer scientists. <laughs> They're going to make lanes narrower, cars smaller, and uh, Mercedes just demonstrated a car where when it starts driving, the, you cannot even take charge because the steering wheel folds up and recedes into the... <laughs> you can't do anything. You see, let me out. You cannot be let out. When the car is moving, it's automatically locked. And the seats will not face the front also, in case you are terrified. So it will just turn around <laughs> and then you can face each other and there will be desks and you work. <laughs> they are saying that's the future. But now what I am asking is one, one philosophical question. When you look at these two cars, they seem to be doing the similar things. But yet there is a very big difference. When you are driving, you have the sensation of driving. The light, the sound, the feeling of driving. The decisions you are continuously making, almost automatically in your mind, all of this driving is a conscious experience. That car, that Google car, with its multiple sophisticated computers, does not have the experience. Even, you'll say, how do you know, Swami? I don't know. But even the Google, the, the, the engineers who have programmed it, none of them will claim that the car is actually experiencing driving. No, it is not. It's a perfectly understandable machine. Now, the activities are being performed, but in this case, the human being has an inner first-person experience, a movie, if you will, of experiencing driving, not just seeing, but hearing sounds, smelling. This is the question that the, the student is asking the Upanishadic teacher. How is it possible? Here is a glass of water, a simple example. I would expect it to taste like water, but if I taste it and it tastes sweet, what will I think? It looks like water. Hmm. That somebody must have added something to it. It makes it sweet or salty. Here is the light. Here is the microphone. And here is the air conditioner. What got into them? That's the question. From outside, what got into them? Now the light is shining. Then in the shop it was not shining. Suddenly you plug it and it shines. What got into it? In the shop it was not amplifying sound. You plug it in and it starts amplifying sound. What got into it? 
air conditioner. It was not cooling the shop when it was in a box. You plug it in and it starts cooling the room. What got into it? What got what one thing got into, which is different from the air conditioner, gets into the air conditioner, makes it cool the room. What one thing different from the light gets into the light, makes it shine. What one thing different from the microphone gets into the microphone, makes it, makes it amplify sound. We all know. We will say electricity. Electricity is not a microphone. Electricity is not a bulb. Electricity is not an air conditioner. The Upanishadic student is asking, what is that one shining thing which makes the bulb shine, the air conditioner cool the room, and the microphone uh, amplifies sound? And the answer should be electricity. In the same way, he's asking, what is that one thing which gives us the conscious experience of living? It cannot be a material thing. The material system is eyes and ears and nose and... Uh, He's not asking about a lesson in how eyes function. He's not asking a lesson in, uh, in how ears function or how the voice box works. No, no, he's not asking for a biology lesson. He's asking for consciousness. What, what is that, that? He calls it Deva. What conscious being uh, manifests all of this? You know how remarkable this, this question is? A few decades ago, consciousness studies really took off, 20, 25, 30 years ago, where uh, at that time a little known philosopher, Australian philosopher, David Chalmers, he walked up to a conference, in a conference and he presented a paper called The Hard Problem of Consciousness. He stood up and he said, there is an easy problem of consciousness. You can do fMRI studies of the brain and say, when a person is drinking coffee, which neurons are firing? Okay, those are the coffee, coffee drinking neurons, which gives you the experience of drinking coffee. When you smell a rose, which neurons are firing? When you feel a pain, which neurons are firing? A science of correlations. You have some conscious experiences, which parts of the brain become active? And that's very interesting to know. That's really interesting to know. But he calls them, all of that is the easy problem of consciousness. But what he says is, what is the, wh how is it possible for a physical system like the brain and the nervous system to generate this first person experience, this inner experience of living? A five dimensional movie where you are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching our lives. It's like Hollywood here, it's just God's Hollywood. That's our life. How does this come about? He says no physical system can generate it. Do you see the dis difference between a behavior and an inner feeling? Our lives are basically... After all, what is our life except this inner conscious experience? All our life is this inner conscious experience. How does that happen? And he asked this question. And it created an enormous impact on consciousness studies. Till today, so many papers are being written on the hard problem of consciousness. We still haven't, and they're saying that it's leading to something incredible. So I was in New York, I went to NYU, they have a mind, brain, consciousness unit. I went there to attend a conference, and whom do I meet? David Chalmers. He's the head. So. I, we got to know each other then. I attended one of his conferences. And there was a Q and A. There was this guy running around with a, with a microphone. And, and then I raised my hand and David Chalmers said, the guy in orange. <laughs> Give it to the guy in orange. And um, then he invited me to a, a debate between him, David, David Chalmers, and Christoph Koch, who is the chief scientist of the Paul Allen of Microsoft fame. Paul Allen Brain, Brain Science Institute. See, now there are two approaches to this problem. One approach is called the reductionist approach, which says somehow the brain and nervous system generate consciousness. That's one approach. That's the materialistic reductionist approach. You would expect science to take that approach because it ties well in well with the materialist worldview of science. But I'm so amazed to see and so happy to see and so excited to see 
There is an equally serious world view represented by David Chalmers and others of his kind who are coming and saying, literally, I saw it in a debate where these two sides in Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, there's a series called Scientific Controversies. These two sides come to a clash. One side saying that it's just the brain doing its thing, generating consciousness. And David Chalmers saying that no, consciousness we have to admit now Consciousness is a fundamental reality. Consciousness is a fundamental reality. He's, he's got, he calls it panpsychism. And it's interesting that it comes from him. He's not a, um, a non-dualist. Uh, 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 he's not a uh, follower of Vedanta or even Buddhism. No. He's coming at it from a purely scientific, philosophical point of view. And he says now that we have to admit that probably... Consciousness is fundamental. Space is fundamental. Time is fundamental. Matter is fundamental. Energy is fundamental. Consciousness is fundamental. Consciousness is not something generated by a living sense system. It works through a living system. He calls it panpsychism. You can Google it. If you read it, it sounds remarkably like the Upanishads. Amazingly like the Upanishads. That's where we have come to. Upanishads go one step further. He says that uh, consciousness is fundamental and so space, time, matter, energy are also fundamental. Upanishads go one step further and say consciousness is fundamental. Space, time, matter, energy, even those are not fundamental. They are all uh, generated. Consciousness is the one reality by knowing which everything is known. Because space, time, matter, energy, they are all manifestations of consciousness. It's not that there is this physical universe and there is consciousness, not that dualism. Universe and consciousness. Upanishads say consciousness alone in which universe is experienced, is generated and experienced. Consciousness alone appears as this universe. How does that work? I'll end with this story. Alan Watts. He was a remarkable philosopher and mischievous too. Very, very, very uh, funny man. I didn't see him, but I've heard his uh, recordings and his book. I've read his book. So he says, if religion is the opium of the masses, then I must say that the Hindus have the inside dope. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, look, it's best explained as a little story. And he tells a story. I'll, I'll tell that story and end there. You see, I'm not giving you the answer to the question. We have run out of time. So the answer to the question of what is that one thing which expresses itself in so many conscious experiences, that answer we will take up in the next uh, class. I think at the end of the month I have on one more Upanishad class. So we'll do that. But let me tell the story which Alan Watts says, tells to explain the Upanishadic worldview. And he says it's a little, like a little story for children. He says children understand it perfectly. Adults not so much. Um, he says, God alone existed. Brahman, God alone existed. But then after some time, God got bored. He was all, all by himself, sort of lonesome, you know. So God wanted to play. But whom could God play with? Because there's nobody else. Whom could God play with? There's nobody else. Now God hit upon a plan. He needed playmates. So God decided to be not God, to pretend not to be God. And what did he do? He pretended to be you, and him, and her, and me. And then God could play hide and seek. God playing hide and seek with himself, but not pretending to be himself, herself, or itself. But then the problem arose. What's the problem? Because God is God. God is awfully good at what he does. So when he pretended not to be God, he got so good at it that he forgot that he was God. <laughs> and he got into a load of trouble. A lot of suffering, a lot of pain. And now God is seeking God. God, having forgotten himself, is seeking himself. That's the universe, that's the game of life that we see. So that's the, a very beautiful story. I think, you know, it captures the essence of the Upanishadic teaching in such a little, like a, like a fable. What is the Upanishadic answer and solution to this? That's the part we shall take up next time when we meet. Um... If I run out of time, maybe we can take one. Should we take a question? Sure. We can take a question. 
You have a question? Oh, there is a microphone. There's a question at the back, at the very back. Thank you, Swami. Hey. Um, uh, I did a lot of activism in the past couple months, and um, I had to like experience like uh, working with Marxists and materialists. Yes. Um, and I was just wondering, like, if uh, I I kind of had to branch off of that, um, but I I think there's a lot of important like things that came out of it and I'm just wondering like is there a, like a prescribed kind of social system that comes out of the Upanishads like yeah. how how we should live like society society yes. wise yes um one thing I've noticed coming out of India to this country is how present oriented this society is it's all about the burning issues of the day I will not name the issues there are political issues the social causes the gender-related causes, the economic causes, and people are so active and up and doing. But I've seen the attention span is just one or two years. Things which were not even talked about openly 20 or 30 years ago are now things to fight and even say kill over now. And I'm sure they'll be forgotten 20 years hence. Whereas in India, you have a very eternal kind of outlook. Maybe it comes from being a very old civilization. This, Vivekananda used to quote this, a thousand years a city, a thousand years a forest. If you have gone through cycles like that, sort of the blood cools down and you say, okay, let's take time over this. But it's an eternal, eternalist point of view. Only the ultimate questions matter. Enlightenment, liberation, spiritual questions matter. Now, neither of them is good. The effect of that on Indian society we have seen. And the effect of this on this society also we are seeing. I've forgotten, there's a philosopher, there's a website also. He says, the Eastern traditions are addicted to being. And Western civilizations are addicted to doing. But the best cure will be the combination of the two. And that's what Vivekananda was all about. In the West, Vivekananda preached the eternal message of the Upanishads, what I was talking about. But you'll, you'll, see, you'll find it very interesting. When he went back home to India, his central message was of social reform and uplift. Uh -huh. And it was very interesting. When he was here, he did not hesitate to point out the materialism of American society in no uncertain terms. He, and people would be annoyed with him. And he would say that I have emptied entire halls. People would be so annoyed, they would walk out you know, when he criticized Western civilization. And people who were anti-Indian, they said things about Indian civilization, he defended to them to the hilt here. But when he went back home, it was just the opposite. He praised the dynamism the, uh, of Western civilization, the equality of men and women, the equality of all human beings, the commitment to work and social improvement, social justice. He praised it to the skies and criticized the Indians no end. He was merciless with, with, uh, with his own countrymen. Just the opposite did there. And there you see a strong message of social activism. Equality of men and women. He said the two great sins of India, of national life in India, have been the oppression of the masses and the oppression of the women. If India is to rise again, it must be by, by the uplift of the masses and the raising up of the standards, of, of the conditions of the women. He said education of women. He gave tremendous em emphasis to that. Sister Nivedita, who went from uh, England there, he gave her that task to start systems for educating Indian women. Economic uplift, social justice, strong uh, emphasis on that. So he based it on Vedanta. Your question was precisely, does it have implications for activism and, and, uh, and social life, a social system? He says, yes. He criticized the existing social system in India. He said, no religion speaks of the glory of human nature in such exalted terms as Hinduism does. You just saw Upanishads. They're literally saying you are God. 
And then he says, and no religion tramples on the necks of the poor and helpless as Hinduism does. As because of the caste hierarchy, tremendously hierarchical society. The privileged few dominating it over the, the underprivileged. He was extremely critical of that, tremendously critical. And he said, a combination of the best of the East and the West. Yeah. So yes, the two can be combined, should be combined and must be combined. And the objective should be to combine them. The Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, mindfulness, he said when he first came to the West, at that time the anti-war protests, the peace protests were going on in Europe. He said something similar, you know, he said, what struck me first was the peace protesters, how angry the peace protesters were. <laughs> and they did not see it. They said, yes, of course, it's a righteous anger. But yes, but peace and anger do not go together. He appreciated that they are protesting for something good. But he also saw that underneath the uh, anger and the dislike of the other side, that does not go well with, um, with the ideology of peace. Okay, one more question. Yes, here. That's it. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you about thoughts. I had, uh, so coming over today and realizing that I'm working really hard to have better thoughts. Yes. But I realize that that's not, the better thoughts are no better than the, the thoughts of the bad thoughts. Um, that's not the solution. Like feeling better and then you know something comes up and you feel worse. So the yes. thoughts, and the thoughts just come unbidden. They just show right. up. I don't know where they come from. They show yes. up, they're usually negative and I'm working to get positive, but that's not it. Yes. So if you talk about that. Okay, the very good question, very precise and well pointed question. His question was, I'm trying to cultivate and get better thoughts. But then I realized that's not it really. That's not the final solution for, which is given in the Upanishads, for example, in Vedanta. The Vedanta says you're not the body. Vedanta says you're not the, not the mind, the thoughts also. But yes, you have and you operate a body and mind. And that's how you work in society. It's like saying you are not the car. That doesn't prevent you from driving the car or owning a car. Okay. Now, what we do in, in life is we try to make our lives better by organizing things around us. Better job, better car, better relationships. As we become more mature, we realize that's not the way out. I have to change my own life to be happier. So better lifestyle, more healthier food, more yoga, less gluten, <laughs> better body. Then I realized that's also not it really. Something deeper, thoughts, emotions. Ideas, feelings, can I cultivate a better mind? But as you go on doing that, rearranging the mind, let me have more positive thoughts, more spiritual thoughts. You realize one thing, the mind is continuously shifting. You may have wonderful and positive thoughts, but they will go away again. You may cultivate it with the hope that one day it will be mostly positive and spiritual thoughts, that takes a lot of cultivation. But even then, it will still change. The nature of the mind is to change. What the Upanishads point out, this is the direct answer to your question. What the Upanishads point out is, you are not the changeful mind also. You are that which notices the positive thought, which notices the negative thought, the presence of thoughts, the absence of thoughts, all shine in the light which you are. Now, center yourself in the understanding. Even the understanding is at the level of thought. But the understanding is, I am that unchanging, pure light of existence, consciousness, bliss. Not a theory, as a fact. Having centered yourself there, I am not affected by the thoughts. I am not, the thoughts might as well be clouds in a shining blue sky. They come and go, I am the same shining blue sky. Now, having centered yourself there, and this is important, then you can spend time in cultivating better thoughts. Better thoughts are no, no, no better than worse thoughts. No, that's not true. Better thoughts are actually better than worse thoughts. Because better thoughts do make you a happy and better person. 
Like a healthier body does make you a happier and better person. So centering yourself in the Atman, existence, consciousness, bliss, know that you are that. Then seek to cultivate positive thoughts, spiritual thoughts, calmer thoughts, helpful thoughts. Seek to reduce the uh, amount of unhelpful, negative, worldly, materialistic thoughts. It becomes a project of self-improvement. Why is that necessary? It's a better reflection of the Atman than negative thinking or, or poor thinking or poor emotional health. Swami Vivekananda said, religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us. There are two words, divinity already within us and manifestation, both of them are important. Once you center yourself in the divinity within you, existence, consciousness, bliss, then what do you do? What about the mind then? The mind is still there. What about the body then? The body is still there. What about your life? The life as the person is still there. You can actually make it much better by manifesting your true nature. A better thought, a kinder thought is closer to the Atman's true nature than an unkind thought. And honesty is closer to the na true nature of the Atman than dishonesty. Restlessness is further away from the true nature of the Atman than calmness. Yeah. It's called sattvic nature. A sattvic nature is a better manifestation of the Atman and a better state of mind in which to remain centered in the Atman also than a rajasic mind or a tamasic mind. Very good uh, question to end today's session with. We'll carry on next time. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Thank you.